Uh, okay, so last time, the la last couple lectures, um, I would say generally we're starting to get into like, you know, we spend a lot of time building up foundations, like basic optimization stuff, basic control stuff, MPC trash off stuff. And now we're starting to get into like fun stuff, application stuff, right? So last time, um, the video lecture that you guys saw was on um, hybrid, hybrid trajectory optimization um, for legged locomotion. And uh, we're going to talk some more about this uh, in a couple of weeks when we get into like case studies. We're going to actually dig into um, the MIT Cheetah control stack and share some of those papers with you guys. That's like this hybrid stuff is basically how all the quadrupeds are, all the commercially available quadrupeds, like the stock way to make quadrupeds walk. This is what they're doing. There's obviously a bunch of RL stuff that's kind of been hot in the last year or two in, in academia, but basically what like... Uh, MIT Cheetah, like um, Boston Dynamic Spot, the Unitree stuff, like all these robots, they're kind of like stock controllers are this hybrid MPC stuff um, that you saw last time and uh, that we'll, uh, again, dig into and read the paper for, for the Cheetah one and kind of spend some more time on that in a couple of weeks to get you some more of the details. Um, any questions about that stuff? Last time? Last couple of times, I guess. Yeah. Let's not do that right now. Let's let's do that after class, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to talk more about that stuff. Okay. Anything else that's like quick and doesn't involve me getting out lecture notes from other lectures? All right. Cool. And yeah, just so for the folks who was weren't here the last couple minutes, um, I've opened up a bunch more project consulting hours slots on Friday, nine to noon. So check those out and sign up. If you haven't talked to me about your project yet, definitely sign up. Um, so I know there's a few that yeah. Yeah, it's the same link as before. It's the calendar sign up link. I'll post a Piazza thing. I'm telling you now, it's the same, you know, you can sign up now for people who aren't here. Yay. I like to throw little Easter eggs into lectures sometimes. So if you show up, you get a, a little bonus reward. So you guys get first dibs. Um, I will post it on Piazza after class, but it's the same calendar sign up link as, as previously. If you want to go find that from Piazza. Okay, cool. All good. All right. So hybrid stuff, we're going to do more of that. Uh, so today, uh, kind of new new directions. The first thing I want to do actually is kind of in response to some um, some of the quiz results and like some some office hour stuff that uh, Kevin encountered. I wanted to give a quick review, um, just at a very high level of like uh, convex versus non-convex optimization and kind of the implications for MPC and control and that kind of stuff make sure we're on the same page on that because this is a very like basic bread and butter thing that, that I feel like everybody in here should know before you leave here. You should understand like the implications of this. And then we're going to get into some new stuff that's um, I think is super cool that that's uh, I don't know works really well. Um, this is and it's starting to get us into like you know closing the sim to real gap and like some things that are good to know about for when you're putting this stuff on real hardware. Um, and this is called Iterative learning control. That's what we're going to spend most of today on. Has anyone heard of this before? Nope. Maybe. Maybe because of hanging out in the lab. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this stuff's super awesome. Uh, and okay, cool. So that's what we're going to do today. So first, I'm going to uh, kind of just like this little like convex versus non-convex story because I think there was some confusion on this stuff. Particularly on, on the last quiz. So, first off, um, just to recap, what does uh, what is a convex optimization problem? And to be clear, this is not like an algorithm distinction. Really, this is a problem distinction, right? So, a problem is convex or non-convex, right? It's all about the problem setup and, and the actual problem you're trying to solve. And what this uh, means is, um, so for a problem to be convex, it means you're minimizing a convex objective function. And we talked about what this means, right? 
Um, earlier in the class, right? Uh, convex sets, convex functions. You're minimizing a convex objective function over a convex set. And that means that you've, that over a convex set thing means you have convex constraints. So some mix of equalities and inequalities that, are co that define a convex set, the convex constraints. And we talked about a bunch of examples of these things. Um, Previously, so generally speaking, this like means you've got like a linear or quadratic objective function, you know, practically speaking most of the time, and then that your con your constraints are going to be things like uh, linear constraints, linear inequalities, uh, or cones, you know, for ellipsoids, things that are convex shapes, basically, right? That the the feasible says the convex shape. Um, so practically speaking, things like QPs and SOCPs, right? So you got cones, you got ellipsoids and you got linear linear. Yeah. You can have linear equalities, aka linear dynamics. Okay. So that's convex opposite. It's it's one hundred percent about the problem, right? Okay, so that's that. And then, um, when we say non-convex optimization, that's um, literally just means anything else. So anything that doesn't follow those rules. So maybe you've got nonlinear dynamics constraints, maybe you've got like non-convex keep out, you know, collision constraints, anything else, then we're in non-convex land, right? Um, okay, and so, you know, most things we care about are non-convex, right? Um, and so I wanted to like make a little kind of table here and to talk about some of the differences between these things and make sure we're understanding like what's, what's going on. So, Say we got convex stuff, non convex stuff. And um, this matters a lot in practice, right? Uh, okay, so first thing um, so do we need a good initial guess? What do we think convex versus non convex? So for for a convex problem, do we need initial like a good initial guess? You no, you can start anywhere, right? And that generally works out. Maybe I should write this slightly differently. Need a good initial guess. You don't need a good initial guess here. Non-convex problem. What are we thinking? You you do right? It's local. Blah blah blah. There's multiple local optima. So you need a good initial guess for this to work. Okay, some other, I can move this to the next. That's that. Um, what else? Okay, how about um, global optimality Guarantee, like, can I guarantee that I'm going to find the global optimum on a convex problem? What do you think? Yes, why? Well, what does that mean specifically about the optimal solutions? It means that well, any local sol optimal solution is a global one. It doesn't necessarily mean, uh, so strongly convex means that there's a single isolated global minimum, but convex or weakly convex, you can have, you can actually have like, you know, say a, a flat, you know, bottom thing that's got multiple global optimum, but they're all the same. So it's like sort of anyone's good enough, right? Okay, so for convex problems, we get the global optimum. Non-convex problems, no, we do not, right? Like there can be lots of local optima, we're gonna just land in one, 
all bets are off, right? Okay, so other stuff. Um, let's say uh, local convergence guarantee. What do we think? So based on the previous thing, for, for a convex problem, we'd say yes, right? Because that's strictly an easier thing. How about a non-convex problem? Why not? Yeah, so there's lots to say about this. Practically speaking, if you're going and trying to solve a hard problem with a numerical solver, all bets are off. Like you can't, you can't guarantee anything. Um, there are, given the right kind of problem with lots of caveats and a good initialization, um, there are methods that can guarantee convergence to a local optimum. Uh, but it's dicey, and in general, this is not the case if you're if you're trying to solve a hard problem with a real numerical solver. So kind of all bets are off there as well. Um, how about infeasibility certificates? What I mean by this is like, if I hand you some random problem that you're not sure has a solution or not, and I can the solver tell me that it's infeasible? We think about this. Has anyone played with uh, CVX or convex.jl a little bit and seen this? Kind of slick. So it turns out for, for convex problems, there are really good solvers and like nice tricks such that the solver can actually tell you if you've handed it an infeasible problem. Um, so you can get these so-called infeasibility certificates with convex problems, which is super awesome. How about for a non-convex problem? Theme of the, the overall message is no. This thing you can't. You can't get any sort of, you know, certificate of, of whatever. So it's kind of all bets are off. It's very easy to write down an infeasible problem. Like you can, for example, say that like X has to be uh, greater than equal to one and less than or equal to negative one. Like that's a set of linear inequalities I can just write down as AX less than or equal to B, which has no solution, right? Because I can't have both of those things be true at the same time. So it's, it's very easy to write down infeasible convex problems. Uh, it's easy to write down infeasible non-convex problems. Well, examples of where this shows up a lot in control is like if you have crazy, basically it means that you have constraints that are mutually exclusive. Like I, if I write down a bunch of constraints and in a complicated robotics problem, this is often possible. Like you can say, oh, I have these safety constraints and I have these really crazy underactuated dynamics and I need to get to this goal in a certain amount of time or something, you can set up a problem where under the dynamics and the torque limits and, and these safety constraints, it's just not possible to get a solution. That can happen all the time. If the problem is convex, then the solver can straight up tell you that. It can be like, hey, you gave me a problem that has no solution. It's not feasible. In the non-convex setting, the solver will just bark at you. And like you'll have no idea if it was actually infeasible or it's a numerical thing or it was a bad guess that you gave it, right? Does that make sense? So you're kind of duck and you have to mess around and see if you can figure something out. Life is harder in non-convex land is the overall message of this. Um, and the last one is uh, bounded solution times. So, you know, this is a really important in a online sort of MPC setting where we have to close the loop at some like 100 hertz or whatever like this to, to actually stabilize the system as we'll run at a certain rate. So can we get bounded solution time guarantees for any of these things? Um, yeah, do you know how that works? Yep. It's Yeah, so the deal here is for a convex problem, if you use an interior point method, you can basically guarantee that you can solve it in a finite number of Newton steps, usually like five or six, this is pretty good, um, from any initial condition. And we know exactly how much a Newton step costs in terms of flops, it's basically the size of the matrix that you're inverting. So you can actually calculate explicitly like the number of flops and therefore the, the solve time for a convex problem with an interior point method. For a non-convex problem, no, all bets are off. Right. And this is why like we we really like even if the problem's gnarly, we solve some part of it offline such that we can solve a local convex approximation in the MPC controller, because then we can guarantee kind of hard real time performance. Okay, cool.
this is just, you know, I know we've talked about this stuff before. I just want to make sure because there were some really iffy quiz answers on this stuff. It seemed like there was some confusion about some of these things. So basically, convex, life is good. You can do it online. You get all the guarantees. Life is nice. If you have a non-convex situation, it's sort of wild west. Scary things, bad things can happen. And you just have to be, it's not to say we can't do this stuff. We do it all the time. But you have to be a good engineer and you have to really like dial things in and be very careful and do your homework. Okay, cool. End of end of rant. Any questions about this stuff? Cool. Okay. So that's the convex versus non-convex review. Um now what we're gonna do is switch gears and start talking about this iterative learning control stuff. I think it's super fun. Um and uh super practical also so uh we're gonna kind of back up a step and sort of come at this from like a maybe a higher level you know philosophical kind of perspective and start talking about what happens when our model is bad which is kind of always the case um there's like a saying right like all models are bad some models are useful this kind of thing right so in engineering like we're making these things up we're trying to write down things that capture enough of the physics to be useful to give good predictions at the end of the day that's what we care about right while being like computationally reasonable and not crazy expensive to evaluate so that um yeah, we, we often, in fact, prefer simpler models, even if they're less accurate in control, because we care about being able to solve, like, basically do the predictions fast, especially in an MPC kind of setting, right? So we'll often go for simpler, you know, cheaper to evaluate models over more fancy, sophisticated, high fidelity models in control applications, because we're making some engineering trade off there. And then, you know, especially in a control setting, often we're doing feedback control. The feedback actually compensates for a lot of model error. So we can get away with, this is like generally a, a good strategy to use simple models. Because at the end of the day, the feedback controller is going to mop up a lot of those errors. Um, that said, right, sometimes that's not good enough. Sometimes if you have a really bad model, your controller will go unstable. Sometimes you have really tight uh, constraints or performance or safety kind of things you're trying to hit. And having a crappier model means you can't hit the, uh, the objectives that you have. So sometimes that's just not good enough. And so now the question is like, what do we do? And I'd say there's like a, you know, a small list of a high level of things you can do. Uh, okay, cool. So some of your options in such a setting would be, um, so like the first one that's maybe most in line with the kind of classical model-based optimal control perspective that we've been kind of mostly coming from in this class so far would be, let's say we have a nominal model, um, but we don't know all of the parameters in the model super accurately, right? So you have, this would be called gray box modeling, and it's kind of like the classical system ID idea. So let's say, for instance, let me write that down. Okay, so like,
the idea would be like, let's say we have a rigid body model of our robot. Maybe we have uncertainty in the uh, like mass inertia parameters, maybe like the link length, stuff like this, right? So like uh, constants that show up in the model, like masses and lengths and things like this, you would go do some experiments, like some data, and then do some kind of least squares regression and try to fit those parameters from data, right? So that's the idea. So this is like, you know, very model based. Um, it has some pros, uh, the first one being it's very sample efficient. So generally speaking here, even if you have a pretty high dimensional, you know, system, um, the number of parameters you're estimating is pretty small. Like even if you're talking about like a humanoid robot, you're maybe talking about like a hundred numbers tops, even in a really complicated model. We're talking about something like a drone that's like single rigid body. You're maybe talking about like mass and inertia is like a handful of parameters, right? So just because you're, you're trying to estimate out a relatively small set of parameters, you don't need a ton of data to do that. So it tends to be very sample efficient. Also, once you do this, you have a model that's valid pretty much everywhere in the state space. So it, it generalizes well. You can um, collect data, small amount of data with a handful of experiments, and then expect this model to, to work quite well across like a pretty broad range of situations, right? Um, the, the downside with this is it's assuming a particular model structure out the gate. And anything that might be going on that wasn't in your prior model so any any physics that was not modeled already by your model you're not going to be able to capture this way so there's this kind of idea of like model class or function class um, you're not going to so if i wrote down like a rigid body model for my robot and i go do a bunch of experiments and like you know for instance if i didn't model joint friction in my model right i'm never going to be able to fit that you know, if it's not there, there's no parameter in the model that represents the, that kind of physical phenomena. It's never going to be in there. And I'm always going to have error, right? So like, even if I collect a ton of data, I will never asymptotically approach the truth with this sort of thing. I can have like out of model class kind of behaviors going on. There's a lot of model structure kind of assumptions baked in here. They can be problematic, right? Cool. I mean, this, and this is also classic like bias variance straight off, right? We're, we're heavily biasing our model in this context. And that gives us this nice sample efficiency win. But there's stuff that this is never going to be able to capture if we haven't explicitly written it down, right? If we don't have a term in the model. Okay, so that's option one. Um, option two would be um, to learn a model. And by this, I mean more like a, a bit of generic function approximator to the dynamics, um, more of a black box model. So rather than, um, here, let's write this, bit of generic. Function here. To the full dynamics. Or maybe the dynamics residual. Maybe you had that uh, nominal model and you're going to just like stick a black box function after that and like try to mop up all the residual error. In both cases, it's a full, it's a very expressive model, right? That can, in principle, kind of capture all the stuff. This would be called uh, black box modeling. Uh, or, you know, black box system ID. Cool. So this could mean, right, like, essentially just take a giant neural net and try to, you know, collect a huge data set and get the neural net to do, to, like, learn the prediction function, right, for your dynamics. Um, so pros for this is it's not assuming, unlike the, the parameter estimation thing, it's not assuming model structure. So, you know, if you're if you were doing residual learning here and you had some nominal model that didn't capture joint friction, if you collect enough data in principle, 
this like you know full black box thing we'll we'll pick up those terms and figure it out with enough data right um it can also generalize uh as long as you've collected data you know within a reasonable reasonable part of the state space um on here is that you know basically the trade-off here is this is very general but it is way less sample efficient and in principle requires a lot of data a lot more data than the parameter estimation version um another way of saying this right like even for a really complicated say humanoid robot the total number of parameters in a rigid body model for that thing would be like order 100 numbers right it's like masses inertias link lengths friction coefficients, whatever. It's a handful of numbers that I can easily do little experiments for and fit. If I basically took like some nominal model or started from scratch for the big neural network, that thing might have to have millions of parameters in it to similarly capture the dynamics to the humanoid. So just because of the num sheer number of parameters we're having to learn or fit from data, I need more than this context, right? Okay. So both of these kind of, the gist is we're trying here to, these are both model-based and, you know, depending on the context, kind of strategies where you go about improving the model and then using the model in your controller, these would be, I'm going to say, you know, wrap these both into kind of this, like, improve the model box. This would be, in reinforcement learning, this would be called model-based RL. In classical control, this would be called indirect adaptive control, uh, where you're kind of you know learning the model first and then using the better model, trying to derive a better controller. So either model-based RL or indirect adaptive control, if that makes sense. The uh, other way to go is rather than like model first, improve model, and then get a better controller from the better model, you can also try to directly improve the control policy given given data and experiments on the Yeah. So the first one is assuming a parametric model. Like I have some first principles physics model, say a rigid body model, and that has some parameters in it, right? Like masses, lengths, inertias, whatever, right? The second one is like I don't necessarily have the physics model. I just put in a black box, like state neural network, and I collect a ton of data and I try to get the neural network to approximate. Does that make sense? Well, I would say the first one assumes physics and there are parameters in the physics that you're trying to regress. The second one doesn't assume any physics and it's just a generic function approximator that's very expressive, but Therefore, it needs more parameters. Yeah. Does that make sense? Think the first one has f equals ma in it, and you just don't know m. The second one is a giant neural network. That's what we're talking about. Does that make sense, everybody? The first one, you'd have like some Lagrangian mechanic stuff or whatever. That's just that you don't know masses and inertia and stuff, and you're trying to fit those. The second one means you don't not you know nothing. There's like no assumptions on the structure, and you're trying to like use a giant function approximator that could in principle express any possible dynamics function. Here's using all, all data, right? Okay, so um, the sort of second kind of class of options here, um, we're gonna start talking about like, rather than learn the model or make the model better and then use that to make a better controller, more directly sort of try to improve the controller. The kind of the first one would be to just learn a policy. This is kind of the obvious thing you might do. This is like the very standard in reinforcement learning. Um, and like, you know, kind of like encompasses things like, you know, policy grading methods, PPO, like these things that are very standard in RL. And the, the idea is we're going to like optimize some kind of 
function approximation. Um, for the controller. So, you know, another thing is we're, we're kind of bypassing the model entirely and we're using our data to directly improve the controller. Right? We're not trying to make F better. We're just going to say, start with some kind of controller, some feedback policy, that's some parametric function and just like directly optimize that thing, right? Uh, so this has some interesting, you know, advantages. Um, this makes very few assumptions. So like, you're not like, you know, assuming anything about the model, about the problem, right? It can be really, really generic in, in some sense, but um, it does not generalize well. Like if I optimize a control policy for a particular task, it can only do that task. It's not gonna be good at any other task, right? It's kind of another saying this is these, if you optimize a policy, it's going to be very task specific, right? Whereas if you if you optimize, if you like learn a model first, you can use that model to then design controllers for lots of tasks, right? Here, you're kind of like doing a bunch of work and at the end, you're going to get something that's task specific. Um, and then similarly, like these things are also generally not very sample efficient. Just like, I guess, a general, you know, kind of gripe with lots of RL methods. Um, like in practice, what this this will require lots of rollouts, lots of simulation runs. And this is why, like, generally speaking, you don't see a lot of these things being run directly on hardware. You might see hardware experiments being used for like fine tuning, transfer learning, this kind of stuff. But usually it's kind of um, policy optimization stuff is done. It takes a ton of ton of simulation time to get something that's like in the ballpark of working. And then you try to transfer that to real hardware by doing some, you know, last little bit of tuning up on, on real data because you just can't get enough data to do it on. Uh, and then like the one we're going to talk about now, which is, um, I guess I'll call like improve a trajectory, I guess. Um, which is kind of where this ILC thing um, comes in, uh, is an interesting, like, I don't know, tweak on this policy idea. Um, what we're going to do is assume that we have some kind of reference to start with that's maybe optimized using some nominal model offline. that that reference model is like reasonably close to right, but not perfect. And then what we're going to do is improve that um, reference trajectory using data from the real system. I would say, roughly speaking, this is like the kind of like optimal control version of transfer learning. like what would be called transfer learning now in like an RL context where you do a bunch of offline rollouts in SIM and then you try to do a little bit of like transfer learning on the real hardware. This is that story. It's that idea, like trying to get at that using like some of the trajectory optimization kind of set of tools that we have learned so far. Um, so cool things. This also makes very few assumptions. It works on lots of weird problems. Um, in fact, like one of the cool things about this is it can handle like pretty bizarro, hard to model dynamics where you just like, they aren't in the nominal model and it still kind of can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like roughly speaking, I would say this is like similar to this like idea of transfer learning where you do a bunch of offline SIM stuff and then try to get it onto the real robot. And because of the SIM to real gap, aka model errors, it doesn't work out of the box on the real hardware, even though it worked in SIM. Same idea. So if you have like some nominal model system and you do some trajectory optimization type stuff offline. And then 
you try to run that on the real robot in the same plane because it's just not doing that simulation. What do you do? Like that's it. Does that make sense? So the idea is you're going to like try it on the real hardware. It's going to suck. You're going to collect some data and you're going to try to fold the data back in somehow and improve it. Hope that after a few trials on the hardware, you can dial it in. In fact, this works insanely well. It's crazy data efficient. It turns out like for quite hard problems, you can do like a half dozen trials on the hardware and it and it nails it. It's really, really good. Yeah, it's, the idea is like what this is gonna do is like try to mop up the sim to real gap from your, your nominal model that you optimize with offline compared to what the real thing is. And it can handle like totally unmodeled dynamics, like stuff that's like completely, you know, that you wouldn't be able to write down necessarily. It's it's a data-driven kind of approach. Okay, cool. So let's see, makes very few assumptions, can handle weird unmodeled dynamics, but it does assume that your prior model is decent. Has to be enough to like get you in the ballpark, kind of. Um, similarly to the policy optimization stuff, this is dialing in the control policy. So it's not, it doesn't generalize, it's task specific. So you're gonna have to do this for any new task, basically, again. And, um, but the, the last pro is this is, very, very sample efficient, like way more sample efficient than any kind of RL thing. Usually you can dial these things in with a few like single digit number of trials on the hardware, as long as your kind of sim, you know, initialization is sort of in the ballpark. Okay, so this whole set of things now, right, we're going to kind of wrap into improve the controller rather than improve the model. And in RL land, this would be called, you know, policy optimization or model free RL as opposed to model based RL. And in classical like adaptive control land, this is called direct adaptive control. So i.e. you're skipping the model. You're not going to try to make the model better. You're just going to try to directly tweak your controller, given the data, right, to make the controller better. So that's called direct adaptive control in the classical control literature or model free RL, right? Okay, cool. So any questions about this? This is like very high level, I guess. Yeah. yeah, basically it's, yeah, like that's one way of saying it. I would, yeah, another way of saying it is it's like task specific, right? Like you have a task, you like optimize something and then you go dial in the robot for that task. And that's what it's going to do, right? It doesn't generalize to some other task because like at the end of the day, the way you generalize between tasks is you're really having a model. Right. So this is skipping the model and just trying to dial in the controller. Yeah. Yeah. So like we'll we'll get into this, but basically like you do your offline thing with the model. However, you know, trajectory optimization, track it with MPC or LQR or whatever. You go try that on the system and then collect data. Like basically what you want to collect are like errors, you know, kind of like from the, the nominal reference or whatever. And then you're going to take that error data and feed it back in and take an optimization step. Okay. Yeah, there's actually tricks for this. It turns out, like, I, I should say also, you can actually do this from scratch on the hardware without any, like, so it, it there are tricks, but generally speaking, the stuff we're going to talk about right now is sort of assuming that you have something that's kind of close-ish and that like what you're going to then do is incrementally try to dial it in better but that said yeah there are lots of tricks and extensions of this stuff and in fact you can do from scratch optimization with hardware in the loop without an initial simulation simulation step it's just harder okay cool all right so let's talk about this what this looks like All right, so um, this whole thing is going to come under the name 
iterative learning control, or ILC for short. Um, and like, basically there's, there's a bunch of like, kind of, there's a ton of equivalent ways to think about this. One way to think about it, if you're coming from like RL land, is you can think about this as like, a very kind of uh, specialized policy gradient method. Uh, where your policy class is kind of your, um, like basically your, your open loop reference in control. So, something like this. So I have u that's a function of some u bar like reference. Got, you know, like the standard kind of feedback thing that we would do where you have your feed forward controls and then maybe some kind of feedback term. So like LQR, you know, kind of thing or maybe MPC. Um, and you've got, so you've got this feed forward reference. And you've got maybe some some kind of feedback tracking controller. This can be anything in principle. And here we're going to assume it's like LQR MPC. And so the idea is we're going to assume a policy class that looks like this, where I've got some feed forward term and then some feedback controller. That's you know trying to do reference tracking level. And what I'm gonna update, the policy parameters that I'm gonna update are the bar reference input, the feed for reference. That's one way to think about it. Um if you're coming from like RL land. Uh another way to think about it. If you're coming from like, you know, trajectory optimization land, which is the perspective we're going to take, is there's there's a few ways to think about it. Uh, one way that is the one again that we're going to take because it's kind of the most general in some sense is um, as an SQP method. So like a, you know, direct collocation style thing, we're using SQP, um, where we get the right-hand side vector. Remember with SQP, we've got like, it's like, you know, KKT system that we're solving. The big KKT matrix has like our cost function Hessian stuff and our dynamics constraint, all that stuff. And the right-hand side has like your gradient of your cost function stuff and your like dynamics error. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to use the nominal model to get the matrix on the left-hand side. So all the Hessian and Jacobian information is going to come from the cost function, which we made up so we know, and the nominal model. We're using the nominal model's Jacobian information. So that whole left-hand side matrix we get from the model and the cost function. The right-hand side vector we're going to get from the data on the real hardware. And we're going to basically do SQP with that. So you can think of it as a weird kind of hybrid SQP method where it's Left-hand side comes from the model. Right-hand side comes from the real hardware. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and I'll make this more clear. Uh, okay, so that's the idea. Um, so let's sort of like write some of this out and dig in. So assume we have a reference for both the um, for both the controls and the states so we've got, and we're going to call that X bar and U bar that we're trying to track. So if I write down my kind of more or less standard tracking control problem here, it's going to be like very you know LQR ish. So like the quadratic tracking cost, so it'll be like the new trajectories, our usual thing. 
I'm going to write down like a quadratic tracking cost. This is just, you know, it doesn't have to be this, but this is what we're going to do. And it is kind of maybe what what's most straightforward and reasonable. So we're going to try to track the X bars and we're going to have, you know, our standard quadratic cost thing. And then uh, terminal cost. And again, if this isn't, a, you can use something else if you want to. It's just the quadratic tracking cost is standard and easy. Uh, and then we're going to have our dynamics. And this is your nominal dynamics model, right? Cool. So if I do this and I write down the KKT system, so like exactly the thing I would be solving in the inner loop of my kind of SQP Newton kind of thing, right? I'm going to have something that looks like this where I've got my Hessian of my Lagrangian kind of thing, my constraint Jacobians, zero block, and I'm solving for what I'll call delta Z here, which is the deltas on the X of M they use on the whole trajectory. I've got my lambdas for my constraints. And then the right hand side is going to look like, you know, minus grad of the cost and minus C of X, where that's the constraint violations. Um, and we'll just make that. So in this case, uh, delta Z is going to be kind of delta X, delta U, blah, blah, blah. Whole trajectory. Um, this C is all of our dynamics constraints. So this is going to look like, say, F of XK, UK minus xk plus one just for all the time steps stacked up dynamics constraints you could have other constraints in fact we will do that but for now let's just talk about the dynamics um, capital c here is the jacobian of this dynamics constraint and then the big h here is the cost hessian this is just going to be like qr blah 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 on the diagonal all the way to qn for all the time steps so right now yeah this is the gauss newton hessian to be clear And that's going to be good enough for us. Like we've said, we're often going to assume that we're doing Gauss-Newton. Okay, so that's that's the setup. This is stuff we've seen before, right? For SQP, like their call stuff. So um, nothing weird yet. But now we're going to like stare at this for a second and try to kind of make two observations. Um, so the first one, is if I were to go do a rollout on the real system, what is this? Uh, yeah, it's zero, right? So like if I do a real rollout, this thing is only satisfied like this. So we don't mind that. Cool. Even if so, and we're going to assume like. Even if I, you know, if it's not exactly zero on my nominal model, it will it's not perfect. It is zero on my which I don't necessarily know. But I'm just going to go ahead and say, since I did a rollout, this thing is like by definition, right? So that's number one. Is only true for the true dynamics, which we don't really know, but we're going to go with that. That's true. Okay. And then um, the cost function in here, the J, I just get to make that up. 
right? So there's nothing model error you send to real Gatha about the cost function. It's a totally made up thing that I know, and I know everything in it. And in particular, I know the Hessian and the gradient of that thing, like by definition. So I know all that stuff. So given that, I can pre-compute this guy. And on the trajectory, I can evaluate. I can evaluate the cost and I can evaluate its gradient just by having the rollout data. And that's exact. There's no approximating anything in there. So um, since we know J, if I do a rollout, We can compute rad j. OK, so now what I've just said there is from a single rollout, by assuming that this is 0 on a real rollout, by just plugging in the, the x's and u's from the rollout into j, into grad j, I now know the entire right hand side of this guy from the data. Here, So that's basically the story. So I'm going to take anything I can evaluate easily from the data, I'm going to plug in. Anything I can't, I'm going to use the model for. The only thing that really comes down to is the dynamics Jacobians. So now we have that right-hand side vector. Um, we know H. And what we're going to do is use the model. Okay, and so another note here on that. So you totally can evaluate C along the real trajectory that you got from your rollout. Um, the way this is often used, though, and the way we're going to kind of do it is if you do offline optimization first and assuming things are kind of close-ish, we can just keep the Cs evaluated at the, the nominal reference that we pre-computed, assuming things are close-ish. That tends to work out pretty well. Since this thing's approximate anyway, right? I mean, you don't have to. Like, you can totally evaluate it and whatever. I'm just saying, like, if it's close-ish, Considering this is all approximate anyway, if I'm like not that far from the reference when I go roll it out on the real hardware, there's kind of no point in updating those Jacobians if I'm close-ish, right? If we're saying it's all whatever anyway, right? So I might as well just leave it, which um, there's reasons for this too that are kind of, there's like other motivational reasons for this. This basically starts to look like a quasi-Newton method. Like if you think about quasi-Newton methods where I approximate the stuff in the KKT matrix, like using BFGS or something like this, if you're familiar with these ideas, this the, the the argument for this being okay thing to do is basically this kind of ends up looking like a quasi newton method like i'm just approximating stuff in the newton solve and you know so then having approximate jacobians and stuff is kind of okay and it should still converge that's kind of like hand wave the argument for why this is kind of okay and so in that context like if i'm everything's approximate anyway and i'm close-ish there's kind of maybe not a big reason to, to bother updating these things a whole bunch that said if you're way off from the reference it's maybe a good idea. So it depends on the context of you're doing this. If you're doing this in a in where you've like optimized something offline ahead of time that's like 80, 90 percent good, and you're just trying to dial it in that last 10 percent, then this is probably fine. If you're like way off and you start trying to do this in a very data-driven way without a good reference, then you probably do want to update the C's. It's kind of context dependent. That makes sense. All 
Uh, so assuming this is already close. We can just kind of keep C as evaluated about the reference. And you can compute this offline. Okay, so now the, the gist of it is um, you're just solving this KKT system. Or the delta Z. Then we're going to update our U's. Um, based on the, the delta U's that we calculate from this update. And then repeat, like as in do another rollout. Um, and then the other cool thing about this, right, is like I can, so I just wrote that on this thing, but I can easily solve this as a QP with things like torque limits and other constraints enforced in this update problem. Okay, so that's like the the big idea. Another way to think about this, by the way, is as like if you were if you wanted to think about this as a DDP kind of thing, you could think about this as replacing the forward rollout of DDP with an actual hardware rollout, and then still doing the backward pass using the model Jacobians in the same way we normally would. Right? Does that makes sense. This is like basically the the gist of this whole thing is you're going to use rollouts on hardware to replace your dynamics evaluations. You're getting rid of your dynamics, explicit f of x u calls, and instead using real hardware numbers for that. But then you're using all the Hessian and Jacobian information from the model and the cost function as normal. Does that make sense? There's a few ways to think about it. The reason we went in at this SQP way is this is um, the standard way that's maybe done in practice. The reason being is it's easy to throw constraints into it. DDP is kind of nasty to handle constraints, and this, this tends to work better and easier, frankly. Um, okay, so questions about that. Cool. All right, so let's write down a quick like summary for this guy, uh, pseudocode style, and then we'll we'll go do it. Okay, so we start with. Uh, trajectory, X bar, U bar. We're gonna do the following thing. We're gonna do, we're gonna get an X trajectory and a U trajectory. Um, in principle, this U trajectory can be different from the open loop U, right? Cause I can have a feedback controller in here to try to track, right? So we're gonna do a rollout on hardware to get this stuff where this rollout is going to be a function of, you know, the starting state and the, the nominal uh, controls. And yeah, note, this can be different. From U bar, you do a tracking controller. Uh, what else? And then, yeah, this is on the real system. Possibly with a tracking controller, right? Then we're going to, because I'm going to start it there, but then it could go off the rails, right? Well, I'm, I might have a feedback policy on there. I could also not have a feedback policy, in which case I'm literally starting at X naught and then just running the U's on it. So the states are going to diverge for sure, right? The U's I have some control over. I could run it open loop so that 
the u the u1 through n minus 1 here is exactly u bar i could do that if i ran an open loop the x's are always going to be different because of the model mismatch right does that make sense i i can i'm assuming that what i'm saying there's i'm assuming that i'm resetting it every time to the same initial conditions but otherwise the states are going to do what they do the controls could be the u bars or i could run a feedback policy on here which in general is a good idea so it doesn't completely go off the rails and blow up on you, especially if it's an open loop on stable system, right? Like a drone or something. Okay, cool. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to go and solve uh, that optimization problem we just wrote down for the deltas. It's going to be kind of this thing, argman over that cost function. Uh, where we're going to have kind of uh so what we're going to assume here is we're going to solve one qp iteration of that sqp thing and then just go run it on the hardware again so we're going to assume that we've linearized the model about like either the reference or our last trajectory or whatever but the the gist is we're doing like sqp or ddp where the hardware is in the loop so we're only ever solving one qp getting a delta update and then running on the hardware again to either think about it as a rollout in a ddp context or as a constraint evaluation in the SQP context. It's always going to be this kind of thing. One iteration, and maybe we have our bounds, right? On the use or whatever. And so the idea here is this thing is a QP, which we know how to solve. And then after we solve that, we're going to update our U-bar. And then you're going to kind of do this until you hit some kind of tolerance that you like. Say, in this case, what we're going to do, the one we're going to do is we're trying to hit some goal. We're going to try to make sure that you know this gets to the goal, within some, roughly speaking. You could do anything else you wanted. Here, right? Whatever you care about. Okay, so we doing on time. We're doing on time. Nice. Uh, so let's go try this. Here's. Uh, can you guys see this? Okay, make this a little bigger. Uh, or the hell. Annoying. My like command plus zoom isn't working. Something weird here. This work. Yeah, I just did that. Okay. I don't know. It's not working on my keyboard. Oh, now it works. All right, go figure. Okay, cool. So um, here's what we're going to do um, we're going to do a cart pull swing up situation. So let's like get that going. This is, uh, you know, 100 times test, five seconds, whatever. Not that interesting. We're going to start at stationary with the pendulum hanging down on the cart. We're going to do a swing up uh, just by specifying. Um, we're going to use uh, Altro, like our lab's sort of solver for this. None of this is super interesting. We've got control limits, though. That's kind of interesting. And we're so setting up control bounds and then a goal constraint that says it has to get the pendulum swung up. We're going to go optimize this guy pretty fast. Uh, cool. We're going to go get the solution out. Um, and then what we're going to do to make this interesting is we're going to uh, write down a true dynamics that has some model error versus the reference. In particular, we're going to like play with the masses a little bit, mess with the pendulum length. And we're going to add some weird like nonlinear friction in here to approximate like Coulomb friction. So we're going to add some unmodeled dynamics too. So like the masses and length stuff, right? That's sort of parametric error. It's still in the model class. This friction thing, it's totally on model. It's out of the model class. So I could not regress this if I tried doing parameter estimation, right? So it's sort of annoying, not nasty stuff, right? Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to try, um, so we'll do some, you know, some of this LQR stuff. We're going to compute an LQR tracking controller. We're going to mess around a little bit. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to roll out the open loop use on the real true dynamics with the model mismatch. And unsurprisingly, um, so this is the X's, this is the thetas. So you can see it doesn't work, right? So it does a little swing and then it does not, does not actually work, right? And then, yeah, use, that's not interesting. 
Okay, so the first thing to do is we're going to go close the loop and put that LQR controller on there. And now we're going to roll it out, close loop with LQR and see what happens. So with LQR, it does really well. It swings up successfully. That looks awesome, right? Like really good tracking. Here's the problem. With LQR, LQR doesn't know about the torque limits. So now it's exceeding my control bounds. So if I go back up here and I actually enforce the control limits by clipping the controls, what do we think is going to happen? So let's run it. This is the same LQR, but now check it out. Now that I clamp the controls, it fails. It doesn't. Uh, so that's it, it like swinging around. Okay. So it doesn't work. So now what we're going to do is go back in here. We're going to get rid of the LQR controller for now. We're just going to turn this stuff off. So, okay. We're back to this where it kind of uh, barks like that. Cool. Actually, I think I want to go and re- Start from scratch from what came out. So I think it was overwriting some of that stuff. Okay. So this is what we started with, right? Where it doesn't quite swing up. Now we're going to go do the ILC thing. So here's, um, this is like very, very similar to the like LQR QP thing we did. It's also extremely similar to the QP based MPC stuff we've done. Um, so this is me just kind of setting up the problem. Um, I have a tracking cost uh, that's like, you know, kind of whatever. Um, it's a nominal control cost. The big thing here is I've put a really big terminal cost on here. I have a big QF. That's so I what I'm saying here is I don't really care too much about exactly tracking the states along the trajectory. I really care though about hitting that final state, that final swing up location. So I've made QF really big and then everything else kind of like benign. Uh, what else is in here? This is just uh, similar stuff to what we did before where I've got, you know, my dynamics constraints. It's like AB minus I with A's and B's that I've evaluated along the reference. And then I've got control bounds where I'm enforcing the bounds on the actual use, right? Not the deltas. So it's you know, U minus delta. And then I stack all this stuff up in OSQP and I go solve the QP super fast. And now I'm going to go update the use, like we said, right? So this is going to make some small corrections on those use. Let's go roll this new one out. And again, this is open loop, right? Anything. And um, it's getting a little better. One thing to note, right, is because I've enforced those control bounds in the QP, now they're enforced on the real thing always, right? So you can see this is starting to really tweak the use at the beginning of the trajectory, and it's starting to get a little better on the on the final thing. So let's just run this a few more times. So that was once. This is twice. This is two tries. Let's roll it out again. I'm going to get pretty close. Definitely getting better. So let's try three tries now. Remember, this is equivalent to like rollouts on the real system, right? So this would be like three rollouts so far. And we're now just about there. If we do it one more time, it would be a fourth rollout on the hardware. We're like just about there. So maybe like one more time, five rollouts. Like we're basically hitting the, yeah, the swing up like right on. So it's like, again, this would be the sixth try, right? So like half a dozen trials on the hardware. And we're basically like totally nailing the swing up, right? Exactly what we want it. Cool. Uh, questions about that? Um, in general, no. Like, there's no. This is a, a non-convex, weird problem, right? The best sort of things we can say about this. There's. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about like some of the, you know, theoretical hand wavy theoretical sort of story here. What we're kind of banking on is as long as the model's close-ish, those Jacobians are in the ballpark, this basically looks like a quasi-Newton method. Then it's like approximate Newton, where the, the matrix is a little bit of an approximation. That's kind of the idea. So it doesn't look, as long as the model's close-ish, it looks kind of like doing BFGS or something like that, where you've got an approximate take key matrix. And as long as you can bound the approximation area, you can say some things about the convergence rate and stuff like that. Um, before we switch gears too much, uh, I want to show you like this actually working on some cool systems. Uh, this was some really, really awesome stuff out of ETH like 10-ish uh, years ago. Uh, it's 12 years ago now doing this stuff on drones. Um, so the idea is they're, they're trying to track like really aggressive trajectories. And this is just showing you like how good it is uh, at like coming up with uh, that's the first rollout, right? It sucks. So after like a handful, like very, very few, right, um, trials on the hardware, you can dial this in like nearly perfectly. 
there else in a sec you'll see some of the so yeah four tries maybe you're getting pretty close yeah Not really, no. You're starting over. You start with a new technique. This is cool because it has a fan blowing on it. It's totally unbottled, right? And like, again, the, the idea is this can like handle stuff that's like nowhere in your model. So it doesn't have to be a parametric model, whatever. It's just something. And like, it basically figures it out. Both trials. Pretty cool. No, the maths. Okay. So yeah, you're starting from scratch though. Yeah. So you would like design the reference, assuming your model. And then you're, as far as the data collection part is, it's starting from scratch on new things. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. This is like, um, yeah. So you're just like, all you're really doing, right, is updating. This is another kind of thing you're trying to track around a figure eight. It's really good at like repeated tasks, like periodic references. Kind of stuff. But yeah, if you're, if you're trying to do a new task, you're basically like starting from scratch on the data collection. The win is that it's super data efficient. So you can do this again, like less than 10 trials. So you basically can like get enough data in the work you really do. So now, yeah. I guess 30 ish on this one, but perfect, right? And yeah, like you go in there, you stick a fan on it, and it's like, you know, 10 ish trials later, it's perfect again. It's pretty cool. All right. Any questions about this stuff? Yeah. If you, if you change the trajectory, like the reference you're trying to track, then you basically are starting over again. Yeah. In terms of the data collection yeah uh okay so last like couple of notes maybe we got a few more minutes i think we can yeah cool so like um why should this work this is getting at some of these questions about like you know the convergence and stuff like this oh sorry Um, so we've already like talked about approximating Newton's method, right? Basically in the form of like Gauss Newton or throwing out some second order terms and like also regularization, right? So we, we kind of know that you can do this kind of stuff and still have it work. Um, so in that context, maybe this isn't that weird. And in fact, there's a huge literature on all kinds of like inexact Newton methods and quasi Newton methods that try to do more of these approximations and lots of theory on these things working. Um, there's lots of these things that you may have heard of before. Um, so some examples, uh, that you may have heard of that I just threw out names of, um, would be BFGS, which is extremely common. In fact, IPOPT is doing some BFGS stuff under the hood, uh, where that's approximating the Hessian from a uh, history of gradients. Uh, there's also, uh, Newton CG is a very common thing to do. Where you like compute the Newton step approximately using conjugate gradient to avoid like forming huge matrices, um, and and in general, there's like a very well developed theory for these kind of things and kind of how much approximating you can do and still converge. Um, and in particular, uh, for a generic root binding problem that you might do uh, Newton on. So this kind of thing, right? This would be the so-called, like we'd call this the exact Newton step, right? If I compute this delta x. Uh, 
as long as the delta x you calculate this inequality down here. So as long as you've got delta uh, f of x plus j times this guy is kind of less than some constant times f of x for some eta uh, less than one, um, an inexact Newton method will convert. Um, so literally all I'm saying is that like, you know, if I use some proxy, it's still going to work kind of intuitively, right? Um, the caveat is the convergence rate will be slower than a, a real exact Newton's step. And uh, so this means that you can use kind of some some approximate, you know, J instead of the exact DFDX compute our step. And it sort of should still work as long as that inequality is satisfied, right? As long as it's sort of close enough that we're still getting consistently getting a descent step. Uh, cool. All right. That's it for today. Um,